Hey everyone, welcome to another exciting episode of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Willard Barth. Willard is an international speaker, thought leader, and business expert. He's founded over three companies in the last few years. His recent company, Willard Barth Enterprises, helps business owners grow their business and strengthen their businesses. Willard has overcome a lot of challenges in the past. You know, he's faced um, cancer. He's um, been really in a difficult place when he was very young. He had to go through through some addiction. And um, through all those processes, he was at a very low point when he now realized, you know, that it's up to him to take control of his life and, you know, create the life he wants to live. So he took control, took charge. And then out of that process, you know, he became unstoppable. He was able to transform himself, transform his business, and just became the best human being he could be for himself and for his family. So I'm pleased to have him on the show today to tell us more about himself, his business experiences, his background, and of course, his book, which is titled The Art of Transformation. So with that said, Willard, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. So Willard, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. How, how did everything get started for you in this your entrepreneurial journey? Um, I, I guess to, to get to the entrepreneurial journey, I have to go back to a little bit of what you mentioned about the childhood. You know, I, I lost my leg to bone cancer when I was eight years old mm -hmm. and that put me in two very different directions. Mm -hmm. One, I became this mega achiever. So I started making a living as a musician at 15 years old, mm -hmm. uh, lettered in high school football, lettered in high school wrestling, uh, had my first business by the time I was 19 years old. But inside, as you mentioned, I, I was I was angry. I had low self esteem, low self worth. So I ended up uh, getting involved in drinking and, and drugs and other things, and, and down that path to where it got me into a lot of trouble. Um, at the age of 24, I finally woke up and was like, you know what? This is not the life that I dreamed that I was going to have when I was a child. Mm. And I realized I needed to to change the trajectory that I was on. Mm. So I started my journey of transformation and really immersed myself in understanding human behavior, understanding psychology, you know, all these different things. And at the same time, continuing to pursue, pursue a career in music and, uh, you know, in, in business. And all those things kind of melded together a little over 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, where I actually started taking my life lessons, both in transforming my own life, but also in what I learned in business and uh, and then starting to coach and consult with others in in business and personal areas of their lives. Mm. That's that's a phenomenal story right there. So tell us a little bit more about you know. Yes, you became well. You lost your leg to bone cancer, but you became a super achiever. And then you know you still had you know some negative feelings that you know caused mm -hmm. you to go into alcohol and drugs and whatnot. So tell us a little bit more about why, in as much as you were still achieving and still succeeding outwardly, did you feel on the inside something was um, wrong or not um, proper? Well, you know, anything that happens in life, you know, we we are the ones who choose the meaning that we're going to attach to it. Uh -huh. You know, somebody can somebody can be in a car accident and the meaning that they attach to it is it's the worst experience in their world. And the meaning another person attaches to it is, you know, the luckiest experience that they weren't hurt or somebody else wasn't killed in the accident, those types of things. Mm -hmm. And it, at eight, eight years old, when I lost my leg, it wasn't just the loss of the leg. I was actually just trying to keep the story a little shorter. Yeah. Um, you know, by the time I was 13 years old, I'd been in the hospital 13 times and had nine operations. Wow. I, the perception that this eight year old child, you know, eight to 13 year old child had was, you know, you, you're, you're running through a very limited filter. You're asking that question continually, at least a, a, as a child. And I think a lot of adults ask it also, why me? Mm -hmm. You know, why is this happening? And when you have a limited frame of reference, when you don't have, you know, a lot of information to go on, you, you, put things together. So to me, the answer was, you know, I grew up in a very religious family mm. and I figured I must be being punished for something. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, why, why else would an eight year old child be um, submitted to this? 
So I was looking at it from that point of point standpoint of going, there must be something wrong with me. I must be evil. God must not like me, all those different things. Mm-hmm. And it really, uh, you know, put a big question mark in the area of my self-worth because mm-hmm. of, again, looking back at it now, it was one of the greatest experiences that happened to me because everything that happened after that built the fiber and the fabric of who I am today. Mm. But at that point, the meaning that I chose to attach to it was there must be something wrong with me. I must be a bad person, etc. cetera. Mm. Okay. Okay. And so you got out of that, you took control of your life and yeah. then you, you, you are still in the music industry. I, I understand that uh, from listening to other podcasts, you've done that. You actually wanted to be a musician and you really love the music business, but you also veered off into the business world and then started working with Tony Robbins. So tell us more about um, your passion for the music business and then how you got links to Tony Robbins and the peak performance motivational industry. Sure. Uh, I actually sang publicly as a soloist the first time when I was six years old. Mm. Um, you know, I was just in a church church uh, environment and the minister heard me singing along with the rest of the congregation and loved my voice and had me come up and, and sing in front of the congregation. And that started a regular, regular thing. So um, when I turned 15, that was when I got introduced to the whole rock and roll side of things. You know, I, I enjoyed listening to rock music. I remember the first albums I got, but I saw my first live performance of a rock band when I was 15 years old. And I just became totally, totally addicted to wanting to pursue that Yeah, because I saw the way that the people in the audience just it, it, it changed everything about them. You know, I mean, the the excitement, the the energy from what these guys on stage were doing. And it's like, I want to impact people that way. And that started the journey in music. And, and as you mentioned, when I became, uh, I got to be about 27 years old, I had been um, approached by a, a manager of a very famous artist and a music publisher out of New York City. And they said they wanted me closer to New York to see how I developed. And I knew at that point that, you know, music business was um, a very, it's a very tough business to Mm -hmm. make it in, you know, especially when you're the artist. And I knew that I had to study the business side of the business because it's called a music business. Mm -hmm. So I started uh, really putting on events actually where I would have, uh, a and R people, artists and, and uh, repertoire people, uh, publishers, producers, entertainment attorneys, they would be my guest panel. And I was educating the audience, but I was learning myself at the same time. Um, at a certain point, again, in my personal growth, I ended up attending a Tony Robbins seminar because I was constantly looking for ways to continue to transform and, and become better myself. Mm-hmm. And while I was at his events, there were a bunch of people who were in the audience that were coming to me asking me to help them understand what was being taught. Mm. And it was a four day event. So some of the staff came over to, to learn more about my background. And what it was, was by that point, I was eight years into my own journey of working on transforming myself. So I had a very good understanding of what he was teaching. Yeah. They realized that and they ended up offering me a job, um, being a a coach for his organization. Mm. Then, because I had the background in music and being a performer, it wasn't long before I was asked to shift into corporate facilitation and training yeah. because I was comfortable being on stage and being in front of people. Yeah. And it's, and it's funny how you mentioned that, you know, at that point in time, by the time they reached out to you, you were already eight years in development of um, your own personal transformation, which means that personal transformation, um, contrary to what uh, most gurus so to speak talk about it's not like you know you snap your fingers and you're transformed or you say a couple chants at the door it actually takes a lot of Absolutely. internal work you know you have Absolutely. to get through what's going on in your mind what's going on in your in your spirit in your soul what's going on in everything around you you have to fix that and that takes a long time well, and, and it's that, that metaphor of peeling an onion also, mm-hmm. because, you know, I've, I've been on this journey now for close to 30 years 
And I'm still growing and still learning new things about myself and still transforming because, you know, this this is a life of evolution and learning and becoming more of who we can become. You know, I mean, when we stop when we stop growing, when we stop looking for ways to improve who we are, we're kind of dead at, at that point. So I agree with you. You know, the, the, the idea that there's a magic answer, there's a magic pill, there's a magic wand that instantly is going to transform your life. That's where it's an industry that sells a lot because there's yeah. a lot of people that are looking for that. Yeah. But the reality is, you know, this is something that takes time. It takes commitment. It takes, you know, it takes, it, you've got to really be involved. Mm. And now how, how did you transition, you know, what you learned about personal development and transformation into the business aspect, like helping business owners and entrepreneurs and corporations transform their businesses. Sure. Well, you know, when you break it down and you look at it, business is people, mm -hmm. you know, in a small to mid-sized business. Let's let's start with small business first, you know, sure. maybe uh, 15 employees or less. Sure. The personality of the business is going to be a direct reflection of the personality of the owner. Okay. Because the areas that the owner has strengths in, the company will have strengths in. Yeah. The areas that the owner has challenges in or has blind spots in, those are going to be the blind spots for the company. Mm -hmm. So if if the if the owner of the business is a tremendous visionary, you know, they're a big picture thinker, they're constantly being able to come up with seeing new ideas and new opportunities, the the challenge, the blind spot for them naturally is they're going to be very bad at putting systems in place to execute what's going on because they just don't think that way. Yeah. And that's what ends up happening in the business a lot of times is the business can be running full tilt and doing all sorts of great stuff. But there's a lot of chaos in the business because there aren't systems and processes in place to support the business and help it scale. So the idea is that to help transform a business, we have to transform the person. Okay. They have to become better leaders. They have to become, you know, they have to recognize that although it's natural for them to be in that visionary mode, mm -hmm. that they either need to put people around them who understand implementing processes and systems and procedures, or they need to be able to step back and shift that mindset themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, everything about business uh, and again, I'm talking about small business right now, yes. um, being around that person, you know, the, the business will be limited by the belief systems, the limiting belief systems of the owner mm -hmm. or the fears of the owner. Now, when you move to a mid-sized business and now you've got, you know, maybe three levels of management, similar thing, but it's not just the personality of the owner. It's the personality of the C-level management. If you have a person who struggles with communication and delegation in one of those departments, that department is going to constantly struggle with, you know, keeping their their timelines and doing these things. So everything about business really is about the people at its core. Mm. So so what you're saying is basically for any business to be performing at optimal capacity, they mm -hmm. need to ensure that, you know, the people that are leading the business, managers, directors, people in the C-suite, have to themselves have gone through some level of personal transformation where they understand that, you know what, I have some head trash in me, I need to fix all that so that once everything is fixed, I can be clear in what I'm trying to tell my team to do, and they will have uh, a clear and a direct path for them to be able to execute on the vision in order for us to succeed as a company. Yes, in, in, in a way. I mean, I never say that anybody has to do anything because I've, no, 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 yes. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> I've, I've come in to work with companies that have been in business for 18 years yeah. and they're thriving as a business. Mm -hmm. They have no interest in focusing on personal development. Yes. But the company then also has a lot of chaos and challenges. True. In it. You know, it's running in a very reactive mode. True. And so, so my, my slight variation to that is if you want your business to run as a healthy entity itself, mm -hmm. you know, the whole idea of behind a business, which I think many people forget is the business ends up becoming a being itself. That's why the law looks at a corporate entity as being, you know, 
something that's individual, not not the people, but the mm-hmm. the entity itself. Mm-hmm. And and if you're going to grow that business, it it behooves you for you and the C-level managers to really know that the person you are now will never be able to achieve the goals that you have for yourself. Mm. You have to grow, you have to adjust, you have to to learn new things to be able to scale and to achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. The goal isn't about achieving the outcome, the goal is who do you have to become along the way. Okay. And the people who recognize that their companies run more fluidly, they're more efficient, they're more effective, and overall, it's normally a a more supportive work environment for the employees because not only do the the owners and the C level managers recognize the value in personal development and transformation, but they also want to get their people involved. They want to get their people focused on, you know, how do you how do you improve so you not only become a better asset to the company, but you become a better asset to the community and a better asset to yourself. Mm. Great, great. So now let's transition a little bit. You, the culmination of your life's experiences was, was put into this, your new book, The Art of Transformation. And in that, the, one of the key tenets is the seven phases of transformation. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what inspired you to write the book and then draw out some of these seven phases of transformation so that people can understand the big picture of what it takes to actually go from where they are to where they need to be. Sure. So, so, um, several years ago, I came off of the speaking, uh, part of my business. I, I had to stop traveling because I had an elderly mother that I moved into my home and was taken care of mm-hmm. and spent about four or five years with, you know, being off the road. And, uh, then when it came to the point in time to go back on the road, I was talking to one of my mentors and I said, you know, I don't want to go back out and just pick up where I left off. I don't want to just be regurgitating the same message that I was speaking about five years ago. And he asked me a question. He said, you know, Willard, there are many people who, um, have overcome cancer and are cancer survivors. There are many people who've overcome drug and alcohol addiction. There are many people who have overcome being in jail, uh, being a quarter of a million dollars in debt, being abused. Um, and he went along with about three or four more things that I had personally overcome in my life. He said, so there are plenty of people out there who have overcome those things, but I don't know of anybody who's not only overcome them all personally, but now helps other people and companies get tremendous success. Mm-hmm. And he said, so what were, he called them the organizing principles, what were the constant principles that were present that allowed me to make my own personal transformation, but that I was also using with my clients? And that started a, a very deep thought process of looking at, well, you know, what, what were those principles that I applied? How did I transform those different areas of my life? And what was I using with my clients? And it took me about six to nine months to come up with the answer. You know, I had a I had a quick response answer when he first asked me, and I realized very quickly that answer was was uh, egotistical and wrong. Um, you know, my first response to him was, "Well, I took responsibility and I stepped into my my inner power." Hmm. And when I thought about it, I'm like, "No, there's a lot more that went into that." And I and I ended up um, identifying what I call the seven phases of transformation. And this was looking at my own work, my clients, but also speaking to people that I'd never coached or, or, or consulted with, but I would talk to them about their own transformations and I would see the patterns in their lives also. So I, I don't call them steps to transformation because mm-hmm. a couple of these phases we don't have any control over. A yeah. step is something I can go, okay, you know, here are the are the principles and the tactics that you employ to move from this step to this step. Mm-hmm. This is actually a phase, and the very first phase of transformation is a phase of ignorance, meaning it's a state of not knowing. Mm. All of us, no matter what we're doing right now, you have your podcast and I'm going to to presume that there was a point in your life where you knew nothing about podcasting. That's right. You, know, you, you were ignorant to the world of the technology of podcasting, the art of marketing and promoting a podcast. Um, you know, whether, whether somebody's opening a business, starting a business, there's a point in our lives where we 
we lack the knowledge that it is even a possibility. So that's the phase of ignorance. True. Phase two is awareness. Awareness is that moment that the light switch goes off. And either because of some, we get to a point and going, I don't want to do this anymore. I've got to look for something different. Or because we're introduced to the concept through a conversation, a friend, you know, a movie, whatever, all of a sudden this light bulb goes off and goes, wait a minute, I could change something. I could do something different. Now, awareness does not lead to transformation. Many people use awareness as their excuse. Okay. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll grow up working a factory job or working a nine to five job and they'll meet someone who is an entrepreneur and that entrepreneur will say to them, you know, look, you don't have to just do that nine to five job anymore. You can take control of your financial future. You could start and build and develop a business because you have such a talent in this area. And the person now becomes aware of going, you know what? I don't just have to trade time for money. I could actually do something, but because of their fears and their limiting beliefs, they go, well, I don't have the time. Mm. I don't have the education. I don't have the money. Well, you're different. The awareness becomes an excuse for them rather than a path to transformation. Uh Phase three of transformation is what I call taking responsibility. And taking responsibility, I, I, I talk about it, it has two pieces that are tied to it. Number one is taking responsibility for where you are. Meaning you have to stop blaming other people. If there's something in your life you're not happy about, you've got to stop blaming your parents. You've got to stop blaming the economy. You've got to stop blaming God. You've got to stop blaming other people. And you have to take responsibility and say, you know what? It's the decisions that I made and it's the actions that I took that put me in this position. And people will often push back. They'll say, well, I had no control over that happening. And I'll say, you know what? You're right. I had no control over losing my leg at eight years old, Mm -hmm. but I have 100% control over what I did from that point on, the choices that I made and the actions that I took. And the moment that you take responsibility for where you are and how you got here, you now have given yourself permission and given yourself freedom to take responsibility for designing where it is that you want to go. So that is phase three, take responsibility. Phase four is what I call immersion. Most people don't succeed at whatever they're trying, whether it's quitting smoking, losing weight, or building a business, because they come into it with a mentality of, well, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to start a business. I'm going to try to quit smoking. Mm. And when we say we're going to try something, we're just giving ourselves a bailout excuse that says, when I fail, I can at least say I tried. I tried. Yep. Immersion is that point of being so committed that there is nothing that will prevent you from achieving your goal. Mm. You, you have to be so immersed in that commitment that you will move heaven and earth to make it happen. You will get up early. You will stay up late. You will try things you've never tried before. You will do things you've never done before. And also immersion is you don't just attempt it once a month or once a week. It becomes a full part of, of, your existence. You know, you live it, you breathe it, you do everything to move things forward. Um, phase five is what I call interdependence. And this was a key distinction for me because early on I said, well, I was successful because I tapped into my inner strength. But the reality was my inner strength came from standing on the shoulders of people who went before me. It came from picking the brains of people who had already walked that path and made the mistakes. It came from reading books and going to seminars and hiring coaches and consultants and sitting down and having cups of coffee with people who had already succeeded and picking their brains going, I don't want to make the mistakes that are going to cost me the time, the money, the emotional hurt. Mm -hmm. Please tell me how you overcame these things. Mm -hmm. So the interdependence was that looking for different teachers to help me achieve the goal. Um, Will it? Yeah. One second. I had a thought here when I was reading the book and I was like, looking at the immersion phase and the interdependence phase, there's kind of like an overlap because for me personally, I was thinking, okay, if I'm in the immersive stage, I would also be 
kind of in the interdependent state. I'm looking for tools. I'm looking for mentors. I'm looking for everything I can to help me get to where I'm going. And I need it right now so that I can absorb myself day and night into that step. So uh, am I correct in saying that it's um, overlapping? It definitely can be. Okay. Yes. You know, for some people, it's the immersion part is about making the decision to commit. Okay. But then if you're moving it to that place of the immersion where I was saying about, you know, you're not just doing something once a month, yeah. you know, reading a chapter in a book once a month. Yes, it do, it is crossing with the interdependence uh, phase at that point of oh. just really where where can I when I where can I become a sponge and take in all the information I can mm-hmm. that's going to help me learn what I need to learn. Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay cool. Yeah. And then uh, phase six is what I call ownership. You know, as we start studying with all these different teachers and learning these different things, two things begin begin to happen. You know, it, it becomes it starts to become a part of our DNA and we start to customize what we've learned to what works for our specific situation. You know, we take what we've learned from all these different books and teachers and recognize that when we do this process of A, B, and C, this is what works best for us. And then also it becomes to a point where we don't even have to think about it. It is a part of who we are. And that's what I call ownership or our identity. Mm. And then phase seven is what I call the phase of influence. It doesn't mean you have to become a coach or consultant, a teacher or a trainer. It just means that by you having made the transformation yourself, you are automatically influencing other people and and sharing those experiences and helping other people step up their game and make their own transformations. Mm. Uh, okay. So now I'm looking at this and, and because I've gone through a similar phase and I'm still going through a similar phase, I understand that, you know, looking at other people who have gone through this transformative process, sometimes when you're in this process and you're going through all this, um, from the point of view of the influencing part, you're going to have to kind of separate yourself from people who do not want to go on that path and journey with you. You know, a lot of people are going to say, oh, you know, he thinks he's better than us or blah, blah, blah. And you find that, you know, as you become, uh, <laughs> I missed the word. I said, as you try to transform yourself, you know, you need to kind of almost isolate yourself you know, so that you can actually do the work that is necessary. And that might mean cutting off away from people who are not aligned with your, your vision and your goals. Do you, do you find that to be um, an accurate statement? I, I do find it to be an accurate statement. Um, you know, there, there, there's a couple of challenges that people run into. Um, there is a, a theory that we become the sum of the five people that we surround ourselves with. Yeah. So we, we don't exceed their goals. We don't, you know, we don't lessen. We kind of keep ourselves right in that same, same, uh, same level with them. And if you're in my experience is, you know, if I want to learn how to run a hundred million dollar business, I need to start surrounding myself with people who run $250 million businesses mm. because I'm going to become the average of what they're doing. Mm. Um, and you know, I, I, I love everyone who's come across my path and I've interacted with. And if those people are wanting to grow and move in the same direction, I am there to help them in every way. Challenges. Sometimes people, because of their own limiting beliefs and their own fears, they end up trying to sabotage your growth. You know, I mean, I've I've had people that I've been helping with, you know, transforming their lives and they come to me in tears because they're saying, you know, my business partner, my spouse, my children are telling me they liked me better when I was the way I was before. Mm. And and, you know, it's 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 a it's a recognizing that when we're making our transformations, we are causing a ripple effect in other people's lives. And sometimes that puts them way outside of their comfort zone. And. You know, I, I want to do my best to help make that transition for them work. But I also want to respect that, you know, if it's not working for them, I then have a choice of giving up on my own transformation to stay in that environment with them or recognizing that I, I'm continuing my on my journey 
And hopefully at some point they'll be ready to come back and join me, join me on that journey again when they're ready for that growth. Mm. I love that. Love that. And as we start to wind down the show, I, I want you to briefly talk about, you know, the three cornerstones of change and then, you know, the keys to success and fulfillment because we've understood <laughs> this um, transformative process. But now, you know, let's see what happens at the end of the tunnel. You know, what's, what's there sure. to look forward to? Sure. Well, but before we go to the three cornerstones of change, one the, this kind of sets up the three cornerstones of change. Okay. There's only two things that will prevent you from making transformation. There's only two things that will prevent you from going from any one of the phases to the next phase. So whether it's going from phase one to phase two, phase three to phase four, whatever the case may be, the only two things that will prevent you from making that transition are your limiting beliefs and your fears. Yeah. Limiting beliefs being when you say, I can't because. Mm. Everything you say after the because is a belief system that you have around your abilities, around other people, around, you know, uh, the industry that you're working in. It's, it's a, a framework that you're locking yourself in. If you say, I can't because I'm too old, you're going to come up with every excuse of why you can't do something. So limiting beliefs and fears are what prevent us from moving forward. The three cornerstones that allow us to overcome those limiting beliefs, to overcome those fears, and to more uh, fluidly make those transformations are honesty, open-mindedness, mm-hmm. and vulnerability. Yeah, We have to be honest with ourselves and with other people, meaning when we say, I can't because I'm too old. Really? Are you too old? Yeah. Is that really true? What if it's not true? You know, you have to look at that and be honest and go, you know what? I know people who start, I mean, Colonel Sanders, you know, is, is, a, is a, um, an example that people have used in the business world for years. He didn't start trying to sell his chicken recipe that later on became Kentucky Fried Chicken until he was in his 60s. Yeah. So are you really too old? Mm -hmm. Do you not have the education or what other things have you learned? So be honest with yourself, but also be honest with other people. I can't learn from you. I can't get you to help me transform if I'm not being honest with you and what my needs are and where I'm at. So honesty, key key thing to transformation. Yeah. Open-mindedness. Albert Einstein said it. We cannot solve a problem with the same mind that created it. Yeah. We can't continue to do the same thing and expect different results. We have to be open-minded to go, what I'm doing isn't working. Let me approach this in a different manner. Yeah. And then vulnerability, meaning we have to be willing to look like a fool. We have to be willing to be wrong. We have to be willing to make mistakes. We have to be willing to, to have somebody call us on our stuff. We have to be willing to be vulnerable. And when we apply those three cornerstones – it makes the transition. I'm not going to say easier because it's not easy all the time being as honest or vulnerable or as open-minded as we need to be, but it will make the transformation deeper, longer lasting and more fulfilling. I guess I would say. I love that. I love that. So right now, as, um, as we start to conclude the show, um, Mm -hmm. tell us, you know, from your own, perspective you know what are some things people can start doing today whether it's personally or professionally to get themselves started on the path to transformation in as much as we've talked about the book but you know in terms of like working on your inner self what do you need to do like take for example if somebody is listening there and is working in a cubicle and they've been thinking so hard about trying to start a business but they just don't know where to go or what to do you know from your own um you know experiences and personal back just tell us like one or one or two tips that they should or steps they should take to start getting themselves on the right path sure one of the, one of the first things one of the first exercises that i have people do in the book is using something that that's pretty much well known right now in the personal development area and the business area it's something that's called the wheel of life okay and and you pick these different categories And you look at it and say, okay, it's my physical health. It's my finances. My, uh, if it's in your business, it can be your sales, your marketing, your HR, your operations, your legal. Uh, but you look at each area 
And you quite simply say, if I were going to honestly rank myself right now on a scale of zero to 10 Mm -hmm. with zero being, you know, this area is just completely non-existent. Uh, you know, there, there's nothing going on in this area to 10. It's at its absolute best. There's nothing I can do to improve it. If I was honestly going to rank it, where am I ranking this area of my life? Yeah. And then you, you honestly rank it. Are you a four? Are you a seven? Are you a six? Just rank it. And you look at all these different areas and then you go back and you say to yourself, okay, what would I need to do to take it to a 10? But doing it again from what do you have control over? Mm. Not, well, you know, if the economy would pick up and my investments would bring back that 60% that I lost, Mm -hmm. then I could, you know, no, what do you have control over Mm -hmm. that you could take it from that, that number closer to a 10? That's the first thing, because that's a lesson in creating awareness. Yeah. It's a, it's a lesson of opening you up and starting to look at things. And if you have to ask other people, I mean, I can remember there was a point in my life where I was a quarter of a million dollars in debt and I wouldn't. I wouldn't talk to anybody about it because it was embarrassing, Uh but I couldn't figure out how I was going to get from that, you know, below zero Uh to where I wanted to be. And I finally got my pride out of the way and went to a gentleman who I saw this gentleman from, you know, a, a, a recent high school graduate going and building his business to becoming a multimillionaire. I was like, if there is anybody who could tell me what I need to do, it's him. And I went to him and I said, look, if you were in my position right now and you had the limited resources that I have right now, and I explained to him the whole situation, what would you, what would you do yourself uh-huh. knowing what you know now? And he gave me those answers. So you may not know when you're looking at your, you know, your number four, you may not know what's going to take you to a number 10. Yeah. That's where you become interdependent. You look to other people. So again, first thing being the awareness part of things. Mm -hmm. And then the second is just really become a a creature of curiosity, Mm. a creature that recognizes that you have capabilities that you never imagined possible. Yeah. And, and it's really just about, learning, self-education, um, you know, finding people out there who have done it before you, because no matter how bad your situation is, no matter how limited you may think you are, there are people out there who have come from worse off situations mm-hmm. and made great things happen. Learn from them, mm-hmm. read their autobiographies. If you don't know them personally, study about them, you know, online, learn about what it was that they did to make those transformations. Mm-hmm. And another thing I will add to that is basically listen listen to podcasts like this. Like that's another Absolutely. one of one of the reasons why I continue to do podcasts is because you know I get to talk to you for one hour and I get to learn about you and I get to even ask questions that you know I may be facing in my business because but because you're an expert and we're on the podcast, you know, if I'm asking you a question that can help me, most likely it's going to be able to help someone out there listening and where they'll be like, hmm. I'm I'm surprised he asked that question, but I, you know what? I really needed to get the answer to that question. So that's, that's another resource. So I I love that. So, so Willard, as I let you go, tell us a little bit more about um, where people can find you, get your book and learn more about what you've done in your business and life and how you can also help them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if they're just looking to learn more about, uh, the things I do with business consulting and some of the other things uh, and the anatomy of transformation, they can go to willardbarth.com. Mm-hmm. That's W I L L A R D is in David B is in boy. A R T is in Tom H.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, also I have a special offer on the book. Uh, it already has become a number one bestseller when it was released. So very excited about that. Yeah. And the, the marketing team that I'm working with, uh, suggested that I do an offer where people are able to get the book itself, a physical copy of the book and an ebook version of the book for free. Mm. All they have to do is cover the cost of shipping and handling. Um, so you can go to the website. It's T as in Tom, a O T book.com stands for the anatomy of transformation book.com. And uh, you'll be able to get a physical copy of the book and the ebook just for the cost of shipping and handling. Yes. Uh, and I just realized right now I've been saying it wrong. I was saying the auto transformation, the anatomy. Okay. 
of transformation, the anatomy of transformation. Great. And I'll put a link to all that in the show notes uh, when this podcast is published. So, Willard, it's been such a pleasure getting to know more about you, learning more about your story, and, of course, learning how to transform myself to become a better entrepreneur. I want to wish you continued success, and I look forward to having you on the show some other time in the future to maybe expand on some certain topics. Thank you. It's been my absolute honor and pleasure. I truly appreciate it. Thank you very much.